in this video we actually go through some stuff that Philip left out in last week's lecture because I think it's more important to get these concepts for real than um, going through more just random stuff with Python. So first of all doc strings. I think doc strings are really important. If you're working with other people than you or you just want to look at your old project a few weeks or months or years later and know what you did. So the first line of every function or class if it is inside uh, three quotation marks is a doc string and python can actually show this doc string for so for example in jupyter i can show the doc string using shift and tab and every good um every good ide shows the doc string when entering a function further on jupyter i can also use a question mark which shows it in outset cell that's the same magic of jupyter i'm going to get to that and even inside code using the dunder method double underscore um, doc, I can even access um, the doc string. So we encourage you to use Google style, which does this args colon and then explains the args and then returns colon and then um, explains the returns. So Google style is explained here. Um, there are also other styles. You could also, for, you could, for example, do this colon param or something is listed here. Um, and the nice thing about doc string is that as in other programming languages. So in Java, you may know, or in C, you may know Doxygen with this kind of annotation. That's something completely different in Python. These are decorators, don't confuse them. Um, but uh, it can be automatically converted into HTML documentation, which is really useful and also really good for you. Another thing which Philip left out are type hints. And that is um, this here. So Python is, um, so Python is dynamically typed, so a variable doesn't need to know what type it is, but you can tell it what it is. Python will never enforce um, typing in the variables, but you can annotate it. And you can tell with this syntax, so that you can tell Python that time is supposed to be a string, people is supposed to be a string, and this function is supposed to, re supposed to return a string. So this doesn't stop you from putting bad stuff into there. So here I had this in the float and an integer. And uh, we see the function executes and the error comes here when trying to concatenate this string with what here is an integer. Um, but there are other tools which can check for this. Um, um, and you can, so for example, I can run, if I have, if I have my code here, I can run mypy, which is such a type checker. I can enter it in the terminal or just use the same magic. I'm going to do that in a second. And this will tell me where eventually I put some in unexpected type into there. So this type checking is not necessary and will never be in Python, but you can do it and it just makes your code more um, reproducible and more obvious to others. Um, if you want to go for more information, this is the way to go. So just to show you here, what I did here is the same as running on the terminal here, um, my pi and then the name of my function. And this tells me that it has an incompatible type. So um, Python expects, the type checker expects something else to be there because we told it was supposed to be a string. Okay, next up, Philip explained to you already arguments. That's rather clear. But I also want to go into detail about call by value or call by reference. So this, if you took informatic A or RUD, as it's called by now, you probably had some exercise about um, if you change, so if you pass an argument to a function and then you change it inside the function, what's going to happen? And we see that here. So in the first one, we pass a list as argument and append something to that list and then check if the argument changed inside the function and if it changed outside the function. And yes, indeed it does. And if we pass something which is immutable, like a string, so we first make a string, then we pass that to this function, and then in this function we reassign that, then inside the function we print something else, what we reassigned inside the function, then outside. So what does this tell us if Python is called by value or called by reference? Well, it's, it's somehow it's neither nor. So if we call the function here with a mutable argument, so with some kind of argument, what's going to happen is um, we um, create a new name inside the namespace of this function for our outside object. 
And if we append something to that new name, we're gonna, so to that object that new name refers to, we append that to the original object. However, if that original object is not mutable and we reassign the, or if we simply generally just reassign um, what this name inside the namespace of the function refer refers to, what's gonna happen is that, well, now we have inside the names of the function, this name refers to something else than outside of the namespace of the function. So I'm going to explain this in a live program thing where you can see what happens with the names and objects. That's just something really nice and that's a really nice tool to see what is going on under the hood of Python. Um, but first of all, what does this mean for us? So um, if we, so there's some important caveat with default arguments, and that is if we use objects as default argument, so for example, no, Philip already explained you the arguments here, and here we have a default argument. So we have a function that has an argument A, which is supposed to be an empty list, and inside this function we append something to this empty list, and then we print it. And if we call this function more than once, what are you expecting as a result? So you would expect that you have, that we print 10 times list, which contains precisely once the element the string no. But that's not happening. Why is that not? Why is that happening? Right? Because this here, this a, is the very same object for every single time we call this function. So every single iteration of this loop, we're going to append to the object this a name refers to. We're going to append another no. So we have no, and then the second iteration, we already appended no once, and we're going to append it more, more often and more often. I'm also going to show that in the tool. To avoid this, always instead of having mute, you can you're never allowed to have mutable objects as default arguments. And if you want to do that, what you have to do is this: you have to have a default argument none, and inside the body of the list, set this mutable argument. Okay. Then next up are the args and the keyword arguments. So Python has some feature which is rather unique um, in programming language that I know of, and that's that a function can have arbitrarily many arguments. So you may have noticed that the print function, for example, you can print one string, but you can also make it print two strings or three strings, also on and so on. So the print function can get arbitrarily many arguments. Um, this is, for example, not that easy to make in Java or C because you would have to overwrite the function. So you would have to define one print, def print with one arc and do stuff here. And then you would have to define another print with two arcs, do stuff, and so on and so on. With Python, this is not necessary. Um, because a function can have arbitrarily many arguments using this splat operator, which unpacks arguments. So what we can do is, we can um, just make, so if we use this split arg argument in the definition of a function, what's going to do is it's going to take all these arguments, which we're calling the function with. So if we print one and two, it's going to take these arguments, which are in the list and make simply in the argument list and makes a list out of this. So if we use the split operator here in the function definition, it's going to take all the arguments and make a list out of this. And this then is a list we can just go through. So for example, here, if we want our screen function, we can take, ar we take arbitrarily many arguments and we make a list out of this using this operator and then can simply loop over this list and print the um, uppercase variant of these. Um, so this would be a possibility of how to make the screen method. Um, so screen function. What's, however, a teeny tiny bit um, bad about the way we just did it is that the print function has the possibility for the, um, we have, for example, the end argument. So normally the end argument has a default argument a new line such that every print you do um, has a new line in the end. And if you, you can remove that and not print a line, but just print some stuff, um, by changing the end here. However, our new screen operator, our new screen function, I mean, oops, doesn't precisely work like this. 
because this doesn't know the keyword argument end. So there's even a better way of making the screen function here. And that is um, when taking all the normal arguments and working on them. So we make a new list of arguments, which we're going to pass to um, the print function. And what we're doing here is so we take a list of arguments here and make that an actual list so we can add as many arguments here as we want. Then we make a new list out of this. And if we don't use it in a, if we don't use the split operator and function definition as here, but in the function call is here, it's going to unpack them again. So this here, so we make a list of the strings here, we work on the list here, and then when we pass it to the actual print function, we let it unpack again, such that the print function gets our new arguments here. And then additionally, we have the split operator also for keyword arguments. So this here unpacks list, and this operator here unpacks dictionaries. However, in this case, we don't care for the dictionaries. We just want to pass the original function whatever keyword arguments we gave as for example, this end keyword argument we gave to the print function and just pass it over. Now in this case, um, we're compatible to the original function. So if we want to, we can scream, um, well, screaming non letters doesn't make sense. And in the end, we can make hashes here. And now Philip told you that, well, Python uh, now replaced the keyword print by a function print. Well, what we can do, we can make, now it's a function, so it's a first order object, and we can make print scream. So now every time we want to print something, we instead scream it, which, where do we do this here, for example? Well, that didn't work. As a matter of fact, we cannot do it that easily. So if we want to replace now our print with our screen, what we're going to have to do is we have to define, for example, the old print as print, and then we can define our print as screen. And then we have to use inside the definition of a stream, we have to use the old print because otherwise we get an infinity loop um, because this here wants to scream again, because this would be the screen function. Now, if we go to old, uh, function definition, everything which we printed before we now scream. Uh, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but, but the fact that now print is a function sort of keyword allows for this. So let's make that, let's get rid of that. Um, you could also get the old print back another way, but I just can't think of it right now. Okay, so functions can have arbitrarily many arguments and we can just do this in one definition of the function in Java or C, what we'd have to do is we would have to define a function more than once and let these, so for example, if a constructor of an object, what we would do is we'd create multiple constructors and let them call the others. In Python, we just define one constructor with a huge list, for example, of default arguments. Um, and just if these default arguments are set, then do this and this behavior. And if they're not set, do another kind of behavior. That's really, really nice. Um, so, like I said, default arguments. So this is this is how you work with the args and the keyword arguments. And so, what also nice to know that there can be arbitrarily many normal arguments before this args list, and afterwards there can be normal keyword arguments. So this is always a keyword argument. So what we could here, for example, do is we define one separator, then a normal list of strings, which may be infinite. So um, Jupyter, we can just add here. And it's get just going to every new parameter, which we list here, it's going to add to the list of args. And then every parameter with, um, well, which is here, new line, um, is just added to the, first of all, it's new line. And afterwards, we could even get more keywords arguments. So afterwards, we could make more keyword arguments and we could even call um, I don't know some other stuff so like I said there's this double split operator which works the same way only for keyword arguments so here we have args and keyword arguments 
and for example, print all the arguments and then we print all the keyword arguments the way we would print them being a dictionary. And then, um, so we could also take, for example, some certain values or keys from these from this list of keyword arguments. So if inside the list of keyword arguments, there's a print type and that print type keyword argument is true, then we also print the type of the keyword arguments, which we expect to be dictionary. Okay, so um, if there's none, we're also gonna print the type here because standard value here is true. So first of all, we print all them here in a list. This is a list. And then we print the key colon value, but colon this, a colon dictionary. And if we had this argument print type equals false in there, um, it would not print the type. Did it change? Yeah, it did change. It. Yeah, it says with the type, the letter ones, the dict. And using these is really useful for inheritance. So I just showed you how to override these, the uh, print operator, but you can also, for example, go for inheritance. So if you want to make a subclass of an already existing class, you can ju just let the constructor or whatever method take this star arc, star star keyword arguments, grab the parameters from the list or from the dictionary of arguments and keyword arguments, and then call the model with the origin parameters. That's just a perfect way of how to do inheritance and it's so nice. And yeah, so if the arguments are already in a list or tuple or dictionary, we can unpack them. So for example, here we have args as a list um, and this range operator, for example, takes two arguments from two and if we unpack them here inside the list, so if we, if we only gave it this args, where the range operator expects the, um, an integer as first argument, and not a list, so we can't pass it on this one value, but what we can do is we can unpack some types of lists. So now this takes as first argument a three and the second argument a six, and thus returns a list from three to five. And we can provide lists or dictionaries as arguments and as keyword arguments. So I could have a function that accepts an arbitrary dictionary. I can just pass it a dictionary which I created somewhere else in my code. This actually gets useful really quickly. I use it in for example, if you're dealing with APIs or something, you can just pass dictionaries to functions which um, have some preset behavior for this and this keyword. So much useful stuff and Python is really nice for allowing this and not having us to write multiple times the same actually behavior of code. All right, um, zip, Philip already told you, classes, Philip already told you all of this. So I'm not gonna go into detail about this. Right, but what I do want to show you is, so I talked about this Corber value or Corber reference, and I just want to give you a more handy way of showing you how this actually is the case in Python. And I think this example here is a really, really good one. So I'm gonna go through that too, but there's this nice python tutor.com, which shows precisely where you can do, go through this example and it will tell you how it works. Okay, so first of all, um, they had the code here that in a not in any other languages, this would, for example, be some line, of some lines of code. So we have the variable, the string variable, some guy, which refers to some location in the memory, and the value fret is inserted in that location in the first line, and then later the contents of the memory location are changed to George, so that fret doesn't exist anymore. How would that work in Python? Well, in Python. It would first of all work like this. So in the first line, and this is where the tool here is useful. So if I click on first, so this, we haven't executed any code yet, and the next line that's gonna be executed is this. And this here then shows the memory content. And we can just step through all of this. So in the first line, what we just did here, so this is the line we just executed. We have the, in the global frame, um, which is basically, so the scope of visibility here and the global scope of visibility, we have this name some guy, which refers to an object, which is a string, which is fret. Okay, and when we execute the next line, we're gonna get rid of the fret here because the garbage collector is gonna collect it because there's no name referring to it anymore and somewhere else on the stack, I know this is not represented too good, we're gonna write George. So first we create a binding between a name some guy and a string object containing fret which means the environment is altered such that a, a binding of the name some guy to a string object to a string object is created in the scope of the glob of the block which is in our case the global frame 
And then when we execute the sum guy equals George, the sting object containing thread is unaffected, but we've changed the binding of this from thread to our new object George. We have not changed either the thread or George string object because while it doesn't look too good, oh, I moved the error, doesn't look too good here because George at the same position thread was, thread was, but the garbage collector deleted thread eventually because there was nothing referring to it anymore and George was created too. So we could also, um, for example, other var equals some guy. So now we don't lose the reference to thread. So if we now execute, execute this stuff, this is how it's going to look like. So here we have simply some two names referring to the object thread. And then when we execute the next name, this here now refers to a new object, George, and thread is still here. So now if we, um, or rather let's not delete it, let's just let it point to somewhere else. We see that we're going to lose thread. Okay. Um, for this tiny example, it kind of makes sense, but it gets more interesting if we execute more complex stuff in here. So in this example, what we're going to do here is, well, first of all, in the first line, the binding of some guy to the string object containing thread is added to the blocks namespace. So now we have, you know, global namespace, basically some guy referring to thread. And then we well, we have this first names list, which is so far referring to an empty list. And then we add the, now this is, this gets a bit complicated and messy, but we add the reference to thread. So we add that as first element of our list. All right. And um, there's a nicer way to render this. And this is this. So let's render it like this. So this is not the perfect how Python actually does it, but it's nicely more, a bit more nicely rendered. So, some guy here is thread and we have our empty list first names. And now we add thread to our list. So note, however, that we now change this thread here. We change it for both because they both, as we see, refer to the same object in the object space. Okay, so a method is called on the list um, first names is bound to, appending the object some guy Appending the object that some guy is name is bound to. Okay, so now we have two existing objects: the stream object and the list object. Some guy and this first names at the position zero refer to the very same objects which we uh, which we see in this way. So they both point to the same, refer to the very same object. Okay, then if we execute the next line, a new name is bound another list of names and this assignment between names does not create a new object rather both names now sim are now simply bound to the same object there's still only two objects this list and the object thread inside it okay and then um well we are appending george to our list um so a member function is called on the object another list of names is bound to and it is mutated to now contain a reference to a new object, George. And obviously both lists now, because they both refer to the same object now, contain this thread George, uh, contain Fred and George. If now change some guy to Bill, if we look at this, um, we see now that this some guy simply refers to a new object. That doesn't change this here because we simply reassigned what our um, name, what our some guy variable pointed to, to a new object. So now if we print all of this, we're going to print bill and then, well, let's switch back to this view easier. So I'm going to print, we're going to print bill and then we're going to print Fred George and then we're going to print Fred George again. Bill, Fred George, Fred George. Right, so then the example continues and shows two more things. First of all, um, what the behavior with mutable and immutable objects is, and then how it all looks if we um, use arguments for functions where there's more than one frame here. And I just really recommend to look into this. It's really, really short. And just while you're doing this, just copy and paste the stuff into this live programming thingy and just let it run through and try to understand what's going on there. It's just really, really useful 
um, to get what's happening here and also to see why for example um, this caveat here um, arises okay so as much for um, addendums to the first week there's just one other thing I want to um, talk about and that is dictionaries we're talking about dictionaries there's one new important change from python 3.5 to python 3.7 and that is that dictionaries now are now by 3.7 officially sorted by insertion order so this here is um if you go into the python documentation and um, this is what you're going to see so um wait um so this here is the link of uh, the python documentation or rather what's new so we saw if we look at uh, this link for 3.6, we saw that um, we see the dict type has been re-implemented using more contact represent compact representation, blah, blah, which takes less space and which also happens to make sure that dicts are sorted. That's just the CPython reference implementation. So CPython, you have to understand that CPython is basically the, um, however you want to see it, interpreter or compiler for Python depending on if you see Python is compiled or interpreted, and the reference implementation. So CPython changed to make dict here better, yeah, using a better representation, which also happens to keep order. And then in three point, uh, Python 3.7, they officially made this, um, oops, this is marked down. They officially made this a language feature. So until th Python 3.7, the CPython implementation, uh, so, that Python compiler that is written by the Python team and is written in C and compiles to C and not like Iron Python or Jython to other stuff, um, the Python you're going to have, started having sorted dictionaries. But in Python 3.7, um, that has now officially been declared an official part of the Python, so a language feature. So now since Python 3.7, dicts are sorted. So if we do this, for example, we have a dictionary with first has A and B in there, and then afterwards we insert a C, we know that if we take the second element of the keys, that's gonna be C. All right, so this exists in Python 3.7 and does not exist in Python 3.5. So if you're, for example, coding on Raspberry Pis, don't rely on this feature. I made this mistake and it took me so long because Python on Raspberry Pis is still have Python 3.5. So yeah. To keep up with new changes in Python, see this link. So note that um, there is Python 3.8 by now, but Anaconda, which we're using, ships with Python 3.7. I don't know when the new version is going to ship, but so far in this course, we're going to use um, Python 3.7. So no Valbus operator, the new hot thing in Python 3.8, which I really love because it makes more really, really nice one-liners. Um, it's not available. So if you want to figure out what um, version you want to have just simply run python minus my what what version you you have not you want to have simply type python minus minus version on the terminal it's going to tell me python 3.7 here and now what is this um i've already shown you before this is so-called cell magic in um what are these percent signs you ask this is cell magic which is available in jupyter and if i write um percent percent bash into some jupyter cell it's going to take everything from there on and interpret it with the shell interpreter. So it's going to behave like I entered on the terminal. There are other um, of these magic operator of these magic operators. For example, I can simply type uh, percent PWD and it shows me my current working directory, print working directory or percent LS also works, which shows me the contents of my working directory. If you want to know all of these um, same magic operators, um, this is where you see them. Sometimes you also use, for example, time it, which times how long um, the execution of a cell took. But most of the time we're going to use bash such that I don't always need to do stuff in the terminal here, but I can simply show it to you in this um, in the cell. And yeah, and then this here is again the link to um, the tool to explore the memory layer, including variables and names. Like I said, go to this link and try running this code in here and it's going to explain you how it works and seriously you're going to need that knowledge eventually because it's not going to bite you in the ass sometime all right as much for last week's addendums first thing of this week is the python data model 